read something online somewhere and it was said, you should be rejected a hundred times a year. And so that was like kind of what I put my mark on. I was like, okay, I'm gonna put out a hundred plus requests to people throughout a year and I'm gonna get rejected a hundred of those times, but it's the 10 other times they don't get rejected that is like what keeps me still like reaching out to people. I'm your host, Brian McCann, and this is the Road to Wine Expert Podcast. I'm continually impressed by Chell Petrus, better known as at Chell Loves Wine on Instagram, and all the wine knowledge she's gained in the past two years. One of the most rewarding parts of looking back on interviews like those with Chell and other speakers is to see the continued growth that many of them have made since the summit. When I listen back to this interview, compared to my recent conversations with Chell, she seems like a different person. And I mean that in the most positive sense. Her maturation as a wine personality is due in large part to her dedication to wine education. So much so that WSET made her an ambassador and she's studying for her level three exam. You can follow along on Instagram as she shares tips, and her weekly quizzes and she's due to take the test in august so go over to at chell loves wine and wish her good luck so let's rewind and connect with chell and discover how she got started so i started reaching out to companies first because i was like i have this small little instagram account i was like i'm going to reach out to companies and tell them how much i want to work with them and hope that they want to work back with me even though i'm a small account you know just some kind of collaboration. So once I started getting above like the 10,000 followers, 15,000 followers, then companies really started reaching out to me and were like, you know, we like your following. We like what you're doing. We think our product will work really well with what you're trying to convey to your followers. So would you be interested in working with us? And so that's what it kind of works out with now. If there's a company that I still really like, I'll still reach out to them, like big champagne brands and stuff like that. I'll still reach out to them and be like, this is who I am and do you want to work with me? So so it's a kind of a good mix. Yeah. So it's a lot of networking, a lot of grunt work. Oh, you know, nice. in your early days, um, did, you, did you ever like have a fear of reaching out to bigger companies or were you just always so, sort of fearless? No, so many. I guess I was always so nervous to like draft that email and in the fear of being rejected, but I read something online somewhere and it was said, you should be rejected a hundred times a year. And so that was like kind of what I put my mark on. I was like, okay, I'm going to put out a hundred plus requests to people throughout a year and I'm going to get rejected a hundred of those times, but it's the 10 other times they don't get rejected. That is like what keeps me still like reaching out to people. I get rejected all the time from companies, but there are companies that still do want to work with me. So it makes it, it like evens it out. Yeah. I mean, people are always going to say no, but it's like the yes oh. that motivates you. And yeah. um, I think whether you're in the blogging side or the sales side of wine or, you know, you know wherever you're at, um, you know, like you're going to get, you know, someone's going to reject you and say, no, oh, but that's yes. okay. <laughs> But if you don't take the chance in asking them, you're never going to have that opportunity to work with them. Totally true. Totally yeah. true. You've got to put yourself out there. Be, uh, be fearless for sure. And that's what like creating your own brand is. You have to do that so much. It's all about networking and putting yourself out there. And if you don't do it, people aren't going to come to you unless they know that you exist. So you have to really network a lot. Yeah. And can you talk about maybe how you found your voice? Uh, I think you're like, I love following you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're like very consistent. It's like very you, yeah. um, but did it take a while for you? To, I mean, now you've built up a, a really nice audience. It take you a while to like get where you are today. Like, how did you go about it? Yeah. It's yeah. so difficult when you're first starting because you have all of these ideas and you just want to go in all these different directions. And so finding my voice was something that I really struggled with at the beginning. Cause I was like, I want to be a lifestyle blog. I want to do traveling. I want to do wine. I want to do all of this stuff. And then I was like, wait, you know, nobody's going to understand what you're trying to do. So I was like, let me focus on wine and let me focus on the people that I really want to connect with. And so that's what I work on catering my posts around is like, would somebody who's like me like this post? So that's how I kind of try to find out who I was. I was like, this is my audience. This is me. Like, are we both going to like this? And so I only try to post things that we're both going to like. And so that's kind of how I figured out like what I'm going to do. 
No, that's, that's great. I think like, um, you know, it's sort of like scratching your own itch, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, You've got to figure out like who you are, like, would I like this? So the audience of me, or like, I always, if I'm writing or doing something bad, I always think of like one friend uh, and I try and, you know, make it for them or write to them rather than try and write to like everybody. Because I think it will like, if you're appealing to the masses, like you said, oh, I'm going to be a lifestyle, travel, wine, you know, all these things, you know, you start no one's interested. No. Yeah. You need to like, my readers are people who like inexpensive wine. That's good wine and don't know a lot about wine. So that's how I try to cater everything that I'm doing is around them. And like, you know, do I also like the product and the post and everything? So when you source information, you mentioned you reach out to certain brands uh, that you like, but how else do you do, do your homework for looking for things? Are you just picking up stuff at like local wine shops, you know, how do you sort of come across products that ultimately make it to your feed? Do I do, I would say a bunch of things. I'm always online looking and I follow, you know, so many different wine magazines and food and wine and all these things. I'm seeing what they're doing. I'm going to wine tastings. My local wine shop is so great. They have a tasting once a week. So I kind of know that on Wednesdays, this tasting (laughs) day, so I stop by and see, what they're um, showing and, you know, what I can try. I have a bunch of other wine bloggers that I talk to. I see what they're doing and who they're working with and what wines they're trying. So all of those things influence like what I'm going to do. I mean, I have a specific kind of product and a specific type of wine that I like to promote. I'm not promoting Dom Perignon on my, my account because my followers can't afford that. So I, I have a specific thing I go for, but I'm constantly looking over social media and the internet just to find the new product. Like millennials like to be on the verge of like what's new and cool. So I'm always trying to find what's new and cool. Well, yeah. And there's like a wealth of information now. There's no shortage of like rabbit holes you can go down to research products. So who are some people uh, I should be following that maybe I'm not, whether it's on Instagram or uh, other bloggers, who do you find like that's influential that people should be paying attention to? If I like, so there's, um, I don't know if you've read the book Cork Dork at all by Bianca Booster. Mm-hmm. I just finished that and I think that she is so cool. She is from this like civilian life then became this sommelier and she's so down to earth and so nice. And so she's somebody that I really love following. And uh, the lady behind Wine Folly, Madeline. Yeah. She's so cool too. And then I love following like the funny wine accounts, like Women Who Love Wine and Once Upon a Wine. I think they just give like a lighter take on wine because wine can get so serious so fast. And I think that it should be so much fun. So I like to follow like a different types of things. And if you really like getting into wine, I love following like winery lovers and other wine bloggers like Hillary uh, Zio that I follow and sure. wine. Like those are other like girls that are in my same niche and have my same audience. So it's always nice to have like that camaraderie with them to like work on all this together. Yeah. It's so funny that you mentioned Hillary. I just talked to her this morning. So uh, she's so nice. She's great. She's so great. Um, Her book, the unfiltered guide to working well, huge for me because I um, abandon, you know, the traditional marketing nine to five and said, screw it. I'm going to go work in a wine shop. Um, and, it was, and her book is so great. It like it gives you the A to Z of like what's happening in the wine world. Like I didn't even know any of those jobs existed until I'm reading through this, and I'm like, the wine world is so huge. There's so many different aspects to it. Yeah, there's something for everybody. Whether you want to be a cellar rat or work in a winery, uh, there's so many different options out there for you. Definitely. Uh, is. So, I would definitely be a winemaker. If I had to be like any other job in wine, I'd definitely be like on the vineyards making the wine. Yeah, that's that's like the romantic part, I think, yeah, for us yeah. outsiders. But it's like total hard work, too. Those oh, people, yeah. Those people don't sleep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they make yummy, delicious things for us, which is awesome. Yes. We're thank appreciative. You. Um, so, you know, you mentioned earlier, like how wine gets like so serious so fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and I totally agree with you. It should always be fun, no matter yeah. what level you're at. But what other problems do you see besides sort of just like the breadth of knowledge that people need to learn to get to like this idea of wine expert? What other struggles are there? Or maybe struggles that you experience personally, like trying to define yourself in this wine category? 
Yeah, I think it's just that since there is so much knowledge in wine, I think people are just scared to even want to take that initial step to learn about wine. I mean, I dove in and I was like, I know nothing, but I'm going to try to learn my hardest. And a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know anything about it. So I'm just going to stick to what I know and not try to expand my knowledge because there are those like wine snobs and stuff that can make you feel like you're not good enough to be drinking wine when everybody is good enough to be drinking wine. So it's just like being scared and not knowing where to turn to can make it really hard to, to want to learn more about wine. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and I think people like you uh, and Hillary and tons of other people out there are doing such a like nice job of like pushing people into wine and like showing them weird things um, yeah. that aren't expensive. You know, good wine doesn't necessarily have to be expensive. I think that's one of those large misconceptions. And people are like, well, I'll never learn anything if I'm paying, you know, less than 20 bucks a bottle or 15 bucks yeah. or even 10 bucks a bottle for sure. Um, so what, what ultimately have you done to like up your wine game? Have you, you know, other than following all these people, which I think is huge, do you get into books at all? Do you, do you read? Do you, you know, who's, yeah. yeah so I'm constantly trying to up my wine game. So my, my thing is, is that I don't know if I'm ever going to become a sommelier because I want to be like, not like the people's person, but like a, a normal civilian person who just really enjoys wine. But I've been reading so many books lately, um, like Bianca's book, and I've been reading um, the Wine Folly book. I've been reading, uh, what's the other one I just got? The Window into the World of Wine by Kevin. Uh, Raleigh, yeah. Yeah, so in-depth and so good. But I do that. I'm going to tastings all the time. I'm always going to um, – events when winemakers are in town and they're showing us all these different wines that they have, trying to do side-by-side -side comparisons, you know, tasting wine is one of the only ways you can really learn about wine. Like you can read as much as you want, but unless you're tasting wine and understanding how it feels in your mouth and all these different things, like you're never going to actually understand wine. So true. And I think tasting is so important and there's so many, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to taste. I know you're in New York, I'm in Chicago. Uh, but you know, like putting together a wine group, getting some geeks together, uh, yeah. Or you and know, I'm part of an Astoria wine club, and they meet once a month, and there's a different theme every month. And somebody cooks food, and somebody, everybody brings a bottle of wine that fits the theme, and you just get an opportunity right there to taste 20 different bottles of wine that you wouldn't have gotten to taste by yourself. Yeah, it's huge. I think community is such an important part. Um, and you mentioned like the studying thing too, like. I know when I was studying, doing the intro and then WSET too, uh, you know, like you feel like you're alone on this island, especially like when you get in a book and you're like, am I like the only person who cares about the Loire Valley? Like, right. So amazing. Um, and then you realize like there's this whole community out there. So, yeah. you know, connecting with people uh, is just so, so important. It is. And the wine world is so big and it's like so big and so small at the same time. Like they're, there's so much knowledge and so many people, but it's also like such a small community at the same time. I feel like if you know one person who knows another person, it's just like that six degrees of separation in the wine community. Oh yeah. And it's, you know, people have run into everybody at some point. I'm sure like New York's even crazier um, oh, yeah. just in terms of how people, you know, network and know each other. But even here in Chicago, it's something I see all the time and like here I am today. And then you're talking about Hillary and Bianca and like all these people, you know, everyone's connected. Yeah, they definitely are. Let me take a break from asking her guest some questions to asking you a question. Do you ever find yourself with a little bit of overflow? You know what I mean. Wines that don't quite fit in your fridge or on your wine rack and you're like, ugh, where do I put these? I'd like to introduce you to a vine box of the German engineered stackable portable storage solution imported exclusively by domain fit up to 12 bottles in a tiny little space it's ever so convenient it's got front and rear access doors which means you can access your wine anywhere it sort of looks like a magic trick like you're about to saw a lady in half you know how they have the doors on either side well don't worry your wine's totally protected it's not going to get sawed in half so if you're interested in wine box and storing some wine Check out Vinebox at getvinebox.com. That's G-E-T-W-E 
I-N-B-O-X.com. And you can remember, oh, hey, he's not saying vine like where grapes grow. He's saying vine like a German would because this is a German engineered product. So you know it's tough. Remember, go to getvinebox.com to learn more. If you were to start over, it's kind of like transitioning, uh, is there anything you do differently? I don't know if I would. I think if I started completely over, I think that I wouldn't have tried to get so lost in the beginning, trying to do so many different things. I think it would have just like jumped right into wine and I maybe would have had like a better idea of the wines I wanted to promote. You know, I was a little lost in the beginning, but I think everybody is when you're trying to find your voice. But I think that I like the way things turned out. I learned so much by making all those mistakes in the beginning um, that it's led me to where I am now because I knew nothing about blogging or, you know, Instagram algorithms and all this other backside of having a blog and running a blog that, you know, goes into it. I've learned a bunch about business and, you know, just so many things that I wouldn't have learned if I didn't make all these mistakes to start out with. Um, so in the same vein, uh, as that question, what advice, um, would you give someone who wanted to do exactly what you're doing? They just need to literally just dive headfirst into it. Like you can't be scared. I was so scared to put my blog out there after I built up some content on it. I was like, what are my friends and family going to think? Like Chelsea knows nothing about wine. Why is she writing a wine blog? Like I was so concerned about what other people think, but you just have to dive in and start writing and start creating great content and putting yourself out there. And if people like what they're reading, what they're seeing, it's going to grow from there. You just kind of have to dive in and start doing it. No matter if it's your blog or your Instagram or a Twitter or whatever you're working on, you just have to go for it. Can't be scared. That's, yeah. You touched on those fears. Uh, like, let's dig in there. Let's go into like that fear. Cause I've, it's something I've faced. I remember like just even sort of conceptualizing the summit has been really like a, a year in the making. Um, you know, I was like thinking about like, Oh, I'll start a wine blog or, Oh, I'll do this. Or, you know, I sort of, you know, in my personal Instagram account, I do some stuff about wine. And then you know, the same sort of doubts crept in like, oh, Brian just started in wine. Like, what is he doing acting like a know-it-all? And like all of these weird like things creep in your head. Um, did, you, so did you experience the same sort of feeling? Oh, so much. Like even now, even I'll still do something now. And as silly as it sounds, like I don't feel like I – felt validated in what I was doing until I had like those 10,000 followers or whatever. I was like, oh, now people like really my friends and family can't be like, Chelsea doesn't know what she's talking about because 10,000 people think I know what I'm talking about, you know? So it was kind of like some silly validation, but I still get nervous when I'm pitching something new or doing something new. I'm like, even working with a client, I create something for them. Like, are they going to like it? Is this going to be up to their standards? Like, you know, there's always that uncertainty that I face, but it becomes less and less as I become more confident in what I'm doing. And all of my friends and family were beyond supportive. Like the fear was completely irrational. Like people in your life are so supportive of what you want to do. And so everybody backed me and supported me and it was really great. And so I really had no reason to be nervous, but it's like a natural human instinct to not, you know, know what's going to happen. Totally. It is. It's like, so when you get on like the other side of it, it's so silly and unfounded, but like the worst part is like whatever demons you conquer and like creating those right. first posts and second and third, like they're still there. They just like rear their head in a different way. You know, yeah. it's like, I'm still nervous talking to people. And yeah. you know, this is like the fourth interview I've done today and I'm still freaking out inside. Yeah. It's always a little nervous. Like I always get a little, like, like my palms are a little sweaty and like, <laughs> I've done like interviews over Skype before and I've like talked, I talk to people all the time, but like you still get that little bit of like, you know, nervousness. It's just human nature. Totally true. It's just one of those things that like it happens. I think it's, it's like that good mojo maybe when yes. like you're onto something good. Like it's that nervousness at the pit of your stomach. What sort of like beer, wine, spirits, what other things are you really into at the moment? I am totally into rosé right now, obviously, because it's getting warm out, and it's just, like, the perfect summer drink. Like, I'm a big red wine drinker. 
whites are also good, but I'm mainly red wine. So I feel like rosé is like my white wine for the summer kind of deal. Um, but I'm all about that. And I'm also a huge tequila girl. So tequila is always like my go-to um, at a bar if I don't want to drink wine. Yeah, right on. That's great. How do you take your tequila? Depends. Sometimes it's a shot. I really like tequila and ginger ale with, with a squeeze of lime. I don't know why. It's just like easy, quick, good to go. Nice. I think, uh, yeah, if I'm at a bar uh, and like I'm a little nervous about their wine program. <laughs> yeah, because you never know. Like New York City has some like, like we're all like the people go and there's like 8,000 people in line and you're like, oh, I'll just get a glass of rosé. It's usually like been open for a little while. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I know. I was like, I always go for something like in a bottle. Yeah, um, safe as bet. That's why alcohol content, you know, that it hasn't been touched with. It's like per perfect safe bet. I can see the person physically open it and yes. know like it's, it's contained, <laughs> um, uh, which is always good if you're ever a little nervous. Uh, yeah. That's why I love wine in a can. Have you had any wine in a can? Oh my God. I'm about to film a video for my YouTube page this weekend on canned wines because they're like popping up all over the place now. Like I saw them a lot last year, like when I, one of my first blog posts I ever wrote was about single serving wine brands and a lot of canned wines made an appearance like the Underwood one, Babe Rosé, Drop, um, ones like that. But I'm actually filming like a video on like five of them this weekend. Oh, very cool. Oh, it's, it's so amazing. And when you think of like a 12 ounce can, that's a half a bottle. So it's like yeah. perfect for BYOB. Yes, it's so good. Like everywhere but the car. That's my only recommendation. Yeah. No drinking and driving. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. Not, uh, um, support that. I will send you um, a couple of my favorites. I don't know if they're available in New York, but I'll, I'll drop. Uh, I'll drop. Yeah, let me know. Because yeah. I've only picked up a couple from my video so far. So I have rooms to add. Cool. So who, you said you had to support a family um, and, you know, friends. Is there anyone, person in particular, who is super influential to your life and wine career as a, as a blogger? and Instagram queen. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that there, um, if we want to go two different ways, I would say that in like the wine world that Madeline from Wine Folly has been such an inspiration to me. I have not personally met her, but I've chatted with her on Instagram before and she's just so like just going for it. She write, wrote a great book that explained wine in such a simple way, which is really what I'm trying to give to my followers. So she was like a good, um, you know, guide as to how I was trying to find my voice. And wine is such a male dominated world. And she's like this kick-ass woman, like doing all of these amazing wine things and has a great following and a great book and a great company. And so she's just, I think she's super awesome. And if we want to go the other way, I would say that, uh, my boyfriend and my mom and dad have been super supportive. What was the last great glass or bottle of wine you had? I actually just had, let me think of what was in my refrigerator. I actually just had an awesome Chenin Blanc from South Africa. Super into South African wines lately. I've worked with a couple of South African um, like winemakers and a couple of people in New York that are selling them and promoting them. And they are so good. So I had a Chenin Blanc, which I got from Wink, which is a monthly subscription that you can do. Um, Cause I saw it on there and I was like, okay, like let's give it a shot because my wine store unfortunately doesn't carry a ton of them. So pick them up where I can get them, but they're a really good white wine. One of the few white wines that I'm like really crazy about. <laughs> Chenin is so great. Um, I love so it good. from all over. Um, and such a good one with food or on its own. Oh, so um, good. I had the most amazing pairing of a Chenin Blanc with Indian food um, mm. a couple months ago because it, similar to those South African flavors in the food, it was so, so good. That sounds awesome. Was the Chenin Blanc like a little sweet? Was it like a Vouvre or do you, do you yeah, remember? Yeah, it was a little sweet. I don't remember um, where, what exactly um, it came from, but it had this overwhelming smell of banana it was crazy. Like you stuck your nose in it and it literally smelled like a banana. I've never smelled a wine that had banana in it before, but it was so good. And it went so good with my chicken tikka masala. That's really good. That's good pairing advice yes. um, too. So it's good. always, I think like some of the best wine moments for me are those like perfect pairings, you know, when you get something, it's like, you probably wouldn't remember the wine on its own. 
but like when it was with the food, it just was like, oh my God, this is stunning. This is incredible. So good. I was just, um, well, I'm actually reading a wine book now called Down the Wine Path or Down the Wine Road. Um, I don't remember who it's by. I could find it, but he was like, oh, I think that, you know, blind tasting wine is silly. He's like, I think tasting wine with food is like how you should be enjoying wine. Like wine's meant to be enjoyed at the kitchen table. It's not meant to be enjoyed in a blind tasting. You know, that's not where you appreciate wine. You appreciate it when you find that perfect pairing of a uh, red wine with your steak or something, you know, and it just like harmonizes. Like that's how you should enjoy wine. So it's so funny listening back on this interview because of all the weird edits and chops. And then I remembered, oh yeah, when I was doing the summit, I had a puppy. She would bark and yelp and interject herself on interviews. And interestingly enough, when I recently caught up with Chell, I was taking my dog Goose for a walk. I'm so grateful for Chell's patience and understanding during the whole interview debacle that was, but we were able to get some pretty decent tape. And it just goes to show why she's an awesome dog mom herself. Shout out to Carl. And and why she's a perfect ambassador for people learning about wine, because let's be honest, the struggle is real. So to follow Chell on her own wine adventure, plus see what she's doing with Carl and Pete, make sure you follow at Chell Loves Wine on Instagram and go check out ChellLovesWine.com. Oh, and she's on JetBlue now too. It's super crazy. And to learn more about the other antics that Chell is up to, go to the road to wine expert.com slash Chell dash Petrus. And you'll see an update on what Chell has been doing in the two years since we last ran into her for a formal interview. Also, thanks to my podcast manager, Talia Goodman, for pushing me to publish, reminding me of deadlines and making the podcast a priority. Thanks to Domain for sponsoring this episode of the Road to Wine Expert. Domain is the nation's largest network of wine storage facilities, but they don't just store wine. They can help you in every step of your journey as a wine collector. That means shipping, receiving, importing, organizing, selling, storing, and protecting. Speaking of protecting, Domain offers two amazing storage products, Domain Cardboard Boxes and Vinebox, a stackable, flexible wine storage solution. For more information on both those products, you can go to DomainStorage.com. They're also available for purchase on Amazon. You heard lots of amazing music on this episode of the Road to Wine Expert. Those sweet, sultry backing tracks are courtesy of several artists who produce their music for free. With the Creative Commons license links to the music so you can use them in future projects on YouTube or your own podcast are available on the website roadtowineexpert.com. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next time.